I really enjoyed all of your, your talks and hearing your own experiences. And uh, uh, several of you touched upon the difference between your undergraduate education and your Yale Medical School education and how it, it changed you. And I thought, yeah, I'd, I'd ask you, and then we can ask the audience to participate also and to ask questions and tell your own stories. But um, maybe we could just start with that. Like, um, each of us is kind of a, a, a laboratory that we, we went through traditional education and we went through the Yale system. And I, I can say I'm different for the Yale system. I, the, the way I got uh, involved with this is I was at and Yale. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so, Lee? 1543? No. <laughs> nice vintage. Uh, I graduated from medical school in 73, went to Yale College, graduated in 69. Uh, my experience is a little bit different. Uh, in many ways, I was trying to recreate a lot of the freedom that I had in college. Uh, so, in, as I said, in college, I majored in history, took pretty much and it the, was the 60s too. Yeah, took pretty much the bare minimum of uh, uh, courses. I paid my way through college by uh, working uh, on his, doing the Yale student laundry. Um, had a, so I was accustomed to being able to be in control of my time and my life. Uh, I took courses that overwhelmingly had papers, not tests, because I didn't like taking tests. So for me, I was trying to recreate that. So no exams, no grades was more of a continuation of college as opposed to what I'd always thought medical school would be, which was sort of as Brian described, lots of exams, lots of memorization. You know, I, when I decided to go to medical school, I told my parents, you know, if I have to, I can memorize the phone book. And that's what I thought medical school was going to be like. And so for me, being able to recreate college and have another four years of what Winter Nitz imagined, which was a graduate school-like experience, that was really what, what made it for me. So it wasn't so much the shift as being able to continue with that, what I'll call, liberal arts kind of educational approach. Yeah. And I would echo that almost exactly. Um, so there I was, a molecular biology, public policy, double major. I had a ton of requirements. But I really wanted to take architecture as cultural expression and music and you know the great professors who were teaching African American history. So I milked the system to the hilt on trying to figure out. I, I actually managed to be probably the only molecular biology major ever to not take biochemistry. <laughs> and I did that on the premise that I was going to medical school and I'd take it then, which I did. And I actually loved it here. It was a great course. But I really tried to maximize all those experiences. And, and similarly, it was both a relief to find that I could recapitulate it and that it would probably be easier um, here than even it had been there, so. Um, well, as I said, I, I, went, I went to a university or college which already had a very progressive curriculum. Uh, and, um, but what struck me when I came to Yale. Could you say what, what year? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I went, uh, I was at Yale from 72 mm -hmm. to uh, 78. And um, I had the pleasure of being at Pepe's Pizza when, when people were climbing onto the helicopters to get out of Saigon. I remember seeing that and hearing what was going on uh, at Pepe's Pizza, um, an advantage of the Yale curriculum. Uh, the, it hit me that medicine had so much disjointed knowledge. You either memorized what Morphan syndrome was, but you couldn't derive it. And for ex as for example, and I remember uh, as a second year student, uh, I went on to the wards, actually to visit my brother, and some wise guy says to me, well, there's an interesting patient in that room. Why don't you go in and tell me what the patient has? And I walked in, and arachnodactyly, she was actually dissecting her, her aorta, and I walked down, and I said, I think she has Marfan syndrome, and he was like, damn it. <laughs> Either knew it or he didn't. And, and I, I, I remember going to pathology, and the chief of pathology back then was a guy named Marshall Lewis. And I said, the problem with medical school is that, well, as an undergraduate, it was understanding. And here, it's just knowledge. You just have to memorize all this disjointed information. And he looked at me like I was a jerk, and, I looked, and the way he reacted, I thought he was a jerk. So the feeling was mutual. And um, 
didn't hurt me. At least I don't think it did. Later, you do your core clerkships and you go back in the thesis, and all of a sudden you, you begin to get understanding. Uh, but the, the one thing that this every medical school does is it teaches us the language of physicians. I agree, I think it's wonderful what the dean said, that an MD means you're a scholar of medicine. And, and I think this school, the way this curriculum allowed us to become true scholars of medicine, to, to explore what's important to us and walk out, being able to talk to any physician in the medical field. Um, and also say I did an MD-PhD in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, and it allowed me to talk to basic scientists as well. So I, I don't get bleary-eyed when people are talking about blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it was a wonderful thing. I learned a hell of a lot, and I, but more importantly, I learned how to act and how to bring in information which I felt was relevant uh, and be grounded. Uh, I was 21, 22. And, um, I had a number of opportunities to skip years, and I never did it. <laughs> uh, so I was 22 in 1977 when I started at Yale, so from 77 to 81. Uh, I feel um, uh, I'm on the shallow end of this group. I was, uh, I went to a liberal arts college, but I didn't do much. I, I was afraid of, uh, of, of the liberal arts part of it. Um, I was okay with math and science. So uh, I, I'm a bit ashamed to admit this, but I took f my freshman English uh, my last uh, year in college because I was afraid um, that I wouldn't get an A. And I wanted to make sure that my medical school application uh, had been submitted. So um, I, I, really, I really came here as, you know, with relatively little depth. Um, and as I said, that, you know, the experience really kind of shook me in, and I, I began to learn for the sake of learning. I also want to point out that um, the clinical experience was really, uh, really changed me as well. Uh, you know, I, I was very much an introvert, and really to be forced to interact with people and to, you know, to do an exam, to take a history, uh, it, it, both, both aspects of my medical education here really had an impact on, on how I uh, turned out, and although I'm a basic scientist, I really did, I practiced um, medicine for probably about 10 years after going to Stanford. Most of it was moonlighting to uh, make money for the mortgage, but, um, but I, I, I still en enjoyed taking care of patients, so. Um. I, I want to say that my story is similar to yours in that I didn't take an English class until my senior year of college. And now I'm a writer, I, I have two books out. And it was because during my undergraduate years, I was too intimidated to take an English class. I, it was the years before multiculturalism. I took one English class my freshman year, did not get a good grade, and decided I couldn't afford it anymore. And it was at, at Yale, actually, that I was encouraged to be who I was. And, um, and now I've published two books. Uh, the University of New Mexico asked me to do a newsletter. And I, I finally said to them, well, you know, this is not what I went to medical school for. And so then they said, okay, now, now do a book about our history. <laughs> and, uh, but um, it's interesting how I had the same experience as you as my undergraduate years. I, 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 even I was not um, courageous enough to take an English class until I knew I was pretty set in my GPA. Maybe at this point we can open up the discussion to the audience here. And if you have any questions or reflections yourself, I entered the Yale system in the middle 1950s. I had to come and bring my own microscope, information technology, it didn't exist. I wonder what your thoughts would be on how the Yale system might be modified, changed, evolved, with the advent of so much information technology being available and the opportunity for self 
learning really much different than I had so many years ago? That is a really good question. When the Yale system started in the 1920s, um, people didn't have um, iPhones, they didn't have computers, and there's just so much more information now that we are in the information age, actually. And so I wonder if any of you um, academicians and scholars have re uh, any thoughts about that? When I uh, do the white coat ceremony with our students at Columbia, uh, I tell them that Half of what I learned in medical school, I've forgotten. And half of what I learned in medical school was wrong. And I keep on hoping it was the same half. <laughs> um, you know, that changes. Uh, I think now what we teach our students is almost all right for now, but it probably won't still be the latest five or 10 years from now. So knowledge, I think, is transient. The way you learn how to think uh, that's durable. And back to what, what Brian was saying, probably the most uh, transformative five or ten minutes of my medical school time was when a professor was doing a differential diagnosis of a patient who, I don't remember what they had, but it was a he and he started off by saying, here's the chief complaint, and let me tell you the things that could potentially cause that. And that way of thinking, suddenly I went, you know, Duh. this is what it's all about. It's being able to take a piece of uh, observation, history of physical exam, and then know enough to be able to start to make logical uh, extrapolations about what could be wrong with the patient and then what you could do. So that's the kind of thing that I think a curriculum has to emphasize. Those are the kinds of skills that are, are durable. And then, as you said, the, the way we get information, the kind of information, that's all going to change. And so I think a curriculum that is, becomes too information-based, by definition, uh, can't succeed. And a curriculum that, uh, I think like the Yale curriculum, has historically been, been that tries to emphasize, you know, how do you think, how do you use information, uh, that's really what's durable and can you know, make for a successful career. So I'll sort of put two lenses on that as well. And uh, I forgot to mention, so I'm class of 94 here. I graduated in 90 from, from college as well. So I think the amount of information has also exponentially grown. So that's it's certainly a problem in terms of how do you fit it in. But I continue to practice medicine, and I look stuff up all the time. Um, when I see something and I don't quite recognize it, I have a framework how to think about it neoplastic, inflammatory, where, I'm a dermatologist, sorry, so it's all pattern recognition. And then I rely on technology to help me hone down and figure out what diagnosis it is. And it's not infrequent that it's come, been named something different, but I can get to it because I understand the fundamentals of the biology and what the pattern that I'm seeing. So that's where I think, again, we gotta teach people how to think, synthesize, evaluate the integrity of what they're finding in their search, because obviously what you find um, differs. But the other huge opportunity is in customizing the learning experience to, again, help people learn the best. Um, when I was at Stanford, as junior faculty, one of my med students, and this was sort of early in the days of YouTube, but Stanford was taping all the lectures, and she would never go to lecture, and she would watch them at double speed. <laughs> wow, that's the thing takes half the time. Um, for her, and of course you could go back, and anything you really wanted to focus in, go listen to a little more carefully, it was a very efficient way for her to learn. That might not be a good way for everybody else to learn. Uh, certainly I think it was a little, um, disengaging feeling for the faculty. So I think that's been a struggle for faculty to kind of get over that they can just be played at double speed and be effective. Um, but she had that insight. And so that's, it's types of stuff of that, I think that is really interesting to help people master the material. Well, the most memorable lecture I had at Yale was the first day in medical school in the Ficken Auditorium. Um, I, does it still exist? I didn't even know. Um, but uh, Lewis Thomas, who was the dean, got up and he walked to a blackboard. There were blackboards back then. And he wrote a date. 
And then he turned to the class, and you remember this, and he said, does anyone know what this date means? So there was a silence, and finally someone said, that's when we graduate. He says, yes, that's when I'm going to talk to you again. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you what's going to happen in the meantime. And he explained the Yale system, and he says, as long as I am dean, we're going to do this. And we all applaud. This is fantastic. And the only thing which is daunting would be to do a thesis. But yeah, the board's OK, and the clerkships, whatever. And a month later, he resigned. <laughs> <laughs> and went off to Sloan Kettering. <laughs> but we did graduate on that day. Um, the, uh, if I had been asked to go into that room as a second year student, I saw someone with arachnodactyly, uh, with a, 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 a dissecting aortic aneurysm. I'd pull out my iPhone, and I'd Google it, and it would tell me the diagnosis, and I'd find out, oh, guess what? It's a mutation in collagen, I forget what it is, one, two, three, whatever, four whatever it is. And I'd say, okay, that's cool. Where's the surgeon? Uh, or whatever. But the point is that I think that's what you learn as a doctor is how to use the tools at hand. And also learn that, that, that it's not static. And that therefore we have to continuously looking for new technologies and new things to do to take us to the next level in treating whatever it is or diagnosing whatever it is. And I'll just say, I'm not going to give you a long talk, but I'll just say parenthetically, uh, I was in academic medicine for 15 years. I've been in pharmaceuticals now for over 20 years, and I've gotten nine drugs approved, and I've, I have gotten, about, I think, about 14 or 15 total indications. Um, when a molecule is synthesized by a medicinal chemist, it doesn't come with a package insert. You have to figure out where to take it. And some drugs uh, really surprise you. Um, a simple example, I have nothing to do with it. Minoxidil, Viagra. I don't need to tell you the story. You guys, you people know this. Um, I was very fortunate to have the, um, I'd say the privilege of trying to figure out what to do with thalidomide. And, um, and there was a real reason for it to be approved. It was the best thing to treat AIDS wasting uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the early uh, 90s. Um, and it also seemed to work for Kaposi sarcoma. It, it also healed refractory aphthystomatitis. And as you can imagine, there was tremendous fear that such a horrible drug could be approved. And uh, we worked out a system so that uh, we could monitor every single, I'll use a bad term, pill. We could track it from the time it was made to when the patient finally swallowed it. And we could also monitor the patients. and um, and. We were able to gain the trust of the FDA, so it was approved. Um, and they knew what they were getting themselves into. But along the way, we discovered that the drug also was active in treating um, a incurable cancer called multiple myeloma. And we were the first breakthrough in that disease in about 10 years. And uh, what that did was it, it created hope among the physicians and patients who had this disease who felt there was nothing else you could do. It also created a revolution because the other companies would look and say, what the hell? These guys don't know what they're doing. Their CMO is a gastroenterologist. What's he doing in cancer? He doesn't know cancer. And they would start focusing on myeloma. Since that observation, there have been now six drugs, you know, seven drugs approved to treat myeloma. The median survival from diagnosis has gone from 30 months to over 15 years. And I believe over the next four or five years, based on what I'm seeing, that we can actually cure people. Or if we can't absolutely cure them, it'll be, uh, there'll be what's called a functional cure. Um, but that's the power of doing something very macro and thinking laterally. And I said, what the hell is a gastroenterologist doing in cancer? By the way, I'm now in pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now in a variety of other things. But the idea, and I learned this at Yale, was to be able to jump from one field to the other with the same underpinning of knowledge so that you could do this. So it I'll, seems I'll like a it. common thread that everybody here has done things laterally. We in public health, you with communications, and you across fields, and, and Brian too. Yeah. So, so I, I guess I have a comment on, um, on the use of the internet uh, yeah, in education. 
So I, we, we haven't, I don't think we've figured out how to use it uh, to the best advantage, at least not in, in the course I'm involved in. Um, I, I think the uh, sitting in the back of, of the class watching uh, students, they all bring in their laptops. Um, some are looking up uh, things on, uh, that are relevant to the lecture. Um, a large number are either emailing or texting other students and not really paying attention. So I think there's a mixture of, of, of distraction and, and maybe the uh, appropriate use. Um, I think the, the most, the biggest uh, change since I was a medical school student is PubMed. I mean, I think it's amazing to be able to to search and find relevant uh, articles. Uh, it was it was a time-consuming process when we were medical students, and I think that's probably the most uh, has had the biggest benefit to medical education so far. Well, I, I researched in um, my entire lecture uh, from another state using digital archives. Any, any other? Yes. Somebody in the back had a question. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to know, Dr. Wang, what your two books were about. Okay. And Thank you for also asking. To um, address mm -hmm. the um, <clears throat> comments by the first responder here, getting back to medical education, um, I started in, we, st we were in the class of uh, graduated when? When was that? Four, uh, 60 years ago. <clears throat> Um, that experience with no examinations until the second and fourth year was absolutely frightening because we had no gauge of where we were compared to the other medical schools. So I think we may believe that we were the only medical school. And somehow we all got through it. I don't know how. Um, I also like to <clears throat> say that I had a, an unusual experience, perhaps even a unique one, my son was admitted to Yale Medical School 30 years ago. And we came to visit after he was admitted and to walk around. But we did so with his grandfather, who graduated from Yale Medical School in 1930 and began to work with uh, Dr. Peterson, uh, studying potassium in blood, at which time <clears throat> the flame photometers were not available till the late 1940s, uh, and they had to precipitate in this terrible way to figure out what was happening in potassium. Um, I uh, would like to say that um, at that time, we went over the curriculum expectations and the expectations of what was supposed to be learned. <clears throat> and back when he started medical school in 1926, the expectations of knowledge was just as great. And it's incredible. We have gone over what uh, his information, but now we've dropped off the minutia that doesn't matter so much, and we got into a new expanded way of thinking. It's been an incredible change. And um, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So uh, I think your, your comment about the uh, no exams and no grades uh, sometimes being the absence of a compass, if you will, uh, is very real and, and very important. Uh, my class, as I said, was I think the second of the 18-month uh, pre-clerkship uh, basic science. And in my class, uh, nine of 90 failed the boards. Uh, and that led to all sorts of a kerfluffle. And it wasn't that much, many years later that they went back to two and two. Uh, I had some very good friends who, who found the, the lack of exams and grades to be just to totally discombobulating because they'd been so accustomed to using that as their markers of how they were doing. So I think the point is well taken that um, uh, when you de-emphasize those markers, if you will, uh, you probably appeal to some students and not to others. And I think 
Okay, we, we face the same thing, as I said, uh, in the way we redid the curriculum at Columbia. And we try to make it very clear to applicants that this may not be for everybody. Uh, because the, there are people who feel that they need those exams to just to know what's happening, or they need them as an incentive to, to do work. And we had people in my class who just didn't do any work um, because you know, they weren't forced to. Uh, so I, I think it's really well taken. And I, I think it does get down to this issue of uh, you know, different curricula for different people. And as strongly as I believe in the Yale curriculum, I certainly would not recommend it for every student. I think you have to know what you're getting into and be confident that you can, can deal with this kind of uh, latitude and freedom. My, my class also was a, a year and a half into the wards. And what we had seen was that, <laughs> well, in, in my class, I think it was 18 who failed. Uh, and, um, but, there was like a frenzy the month before the wards. We the classes stopped and people were just cramming for the part one. And I decided I didn't want to be part of that. So over the summer, I read the entire second year and took the boards in that seat over there um, for and 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 passed. It actually, I did fairly well. The my best subject was pharmacology, by the way, and. Um, but the fellow who sat next to me was also another MD, PhD, and uh, Tim got the highest mark on the boards in the entire country, uh, which was something. And the third guy who sat over there, um, he failed the board and had to take it again when, with the rest of his class. He's now a, a professor at Yale, as, as I've done very, very well, by the way. So uh, there you go. Um, I agree with you 100%. It takes a certain type of person who wants to go into this environment, uh, and as many pre-meds who are, you know, got to get the gray, got to get the gray, got to get gray, all of a sudden they're decompressed, and some people just don't know how to handle it. Um, I've been, I was very disappointed with what happened with this curriculum by going two and two, and now, uh, last year I learned that people take exams but it's blinded to the professors as to what the grades are. It's for self-improvement. And uh, my feeling is that Yale should have responded with stronger tutoring and mentoring for those who were floundering. Now, maybe you don't identify yourselves until you fail part one of the national boards, but I, I think there's something very special about this institution and the way it, it ran its, its curriculum way back when. And I, I really hope it doesn't become just another cookie cutter medical school. Yeah, I would just, so when I was here, we had anonymous exams. Um, they were mandatory, so you knew how you did. Um, and I have to say, again, my goal in life is never to be med mediocre, but there were times where it felt perfectly okay to be mediocre on those. But I do think it provided a safety net in helping to identify people who were, the system was not serving well, early enough in the game that you could intervene. And that we do have responsibility to, to identify those folks and intervene in whatever way is appropriate. So they're having some guardrails and some backup to capture that group before it becomes too late and they deal with having had a failure on their exams, I think is an important part. It's just hard to know how to do that. Um, and the anonymous exams are not a bad way. Um, they're one of probably several. Well, I, I'm reminded of the past Olympics when uh, swimmer Michael Phelps had these strange cuppings on his back and people asked about it and it was moxibustion and they said, so he said, and the commentators on TV were saying, well, you're talking about a tenth of a second and what makes a difference in the tenth of a second? And, in, and I'm sitting here with all of you and for example, Brian getting the Nobel Prize and doing the research to deserve that and um, and I'm just wondering for, for you, when you started here, um, if you were held to a curriculum or to um, taking the classes that most people would take instead of the advanced classes that you took, um, what, what difference would that have made? Does the Yale system give people an edge to uh, accomplish more and, and do more with what they have to give the world? I think in my case, I wasn't mature enough to have uh, 
decided I would try to go beyond what I was expected to do. Um, I was trained to, or at least I, I developed the, the idea that I needed to score as high as possible on the exam. So, I mean, that's, so coming here, I, uh, I, I probably learned much more uh, than I would have otherwise. Uh, and, and certainly, um, I, I'm really concerned about curricula now where uh, they're compressing the time because there's too much to learn, so let's just minimize what they need to learn. And so, yeah, I, I, I think it made, a big, it made a very big difference for me. It made me actually appreciate that um, I could do outside reading that wasn't necessarily a sign and what was really interesting, and it, I, I explored areas that I never would have otherwise. Because of the flexibility in the curriculum? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I actually have a question for, so when, in, when I came in, in 1977, there was a requirement that we pass all sections of the boards, and I think yes. that was relatively new. Uh, I don't know whether that made us gave us an additional element of fear that even if we failed one component that we w couldn't go on to the ward, so maybe that helped us to uh, maybe study more than you? We had to pass all as well. Okay. Yeah. I just, I got barely passing grades in two of the six, but I passed. <laughs> I, I, I believe that was, um, goes back to the 40s actually, and, and I experienced that too in the 1980s. Yeah. There's a, Question back here. I just wanted to ask you all about your own experiences um, in collaborative learning. So my name's Kinnery Webb and I graduated Hi. in 2002 and I started a nonprofit afterwards and it was my three best friends in medical school who we studied together all the time and it was this powerful experience. And those, the four of us are still really close friends and two of those women have been actually board chairmen for me. And it's just, I, I just feel like that is, I'm not, and just recently when I saw them, because they came here when I gave the commencement address, one of them said, you know, I don't know if that would have happened at another school, because there was no sense of competition at all. So, so does the Yale system teach a greater spirit of collaboration instead of um, competitiveness? Well, the, the big elephant in the room when you're in your first two years of medical school is that you're going to go into the wards and, and you're supposed to know enough to be a doctor. Uh, you know, I would say that's, that's not, I mean, that's the, that's the elephant in the room. That, that's what you feel, at least that's the way I felt and I think my, my other classmates felt. Um, you, what, what we found was that at the end of the, those rotations, we were much different people than we were when we were trying to get ready to go onto the wards. Um, what I found and what I discovered when I went on the wards was there could be more than one A in a group. More than one A, uh, we could all succeed because after all, medicine's quite diverse and by the way, if you want to go into a field, most fields are quite large enough to accommodate <laughs> the other three or four people who are rotating with me. So um, it's it's, I think that was also an important part of, of Yale, was that um, we had the time to interact with uh, people who were a year or two ahead of us and understand what they were going through so we could learn how to behave when we hit the wards the first time. And I also found that my classmates were quite uh, giving and giving me advice. Jerry, you're screwing up here, and if you only sat back one second and thought about it, you'd probably do a better job. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> And I would say there was no question in the first two years that we taught each other. I had a very similar experience to what you had. What was interesting, because I hadn't really thought about it until you mentioned it, is we all pick different books, right? So we actually learned from different texts in different ways and then taught each other in a way that synthesized the information in a, in a really robust way. I remember my best friend was a neuroscientist, right? So she brought a whole lens to things where I was much more interested in inflammation. So I think there was that. And interestingly, third and fourth year when I was there was more competitive. It had more of a grade-like feel where people were competing in that same place. But in the first two years, it was very collaborative. 
Well, I spent my first year and a half on the lunatic fringe uh, pretty much alone. Uh, so I didn't feel like I was competing with anybody, but there was nobody else uh, doing what I was doing. So I, I lost that opportunity. Um, I, I think I benefited a lot from the fact that I didn't feel like I was competing with anybody else, but I was mostly on my own, as I said, lunatic fringe trajectory. So I didn't really get that kind of uh, uh, feeling that uh, some of you probably did, and I, I think I, I missed the fact that I didn't have that, but that was the, the price I paid for it taking me a crazy pathway. Actually, I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, because I took the boards in, in the fall before the spring when you were supposed to take it, uh, everyone else was in this study frenzy, and I took OBGYN. And I was the only student in OBGYN for OB for a three-week period, and I delivered about 40 children, uh, <laughs> which I would never have done if I had taken it during a normal rotation. So that was a very nice thing. I got to really understand uh, or do a lot in OBGYN. <laughs> Um, but it's, that's the downside is the lack of grades and the lack of exams. I, I honestly think that when I see the dean present that there were 4,300 applications for 104 medical students, uh, the, the admissions committee could probably find people who are self-starters and, and what the curriculum does is it helps ground you that you can believe in yourself and move forward. And, I, and so in my mind, uh, I'm a very strong supporter of the good old days, and, and I hate to say that, because I, when I was a student, I'd hate to hear some old fart alumnus say, well, in the good old <laughs> days, we did this. But I, I think it works, and I think we have, as I often do is look at my own class and see the people who, what they've accomplished, and I'm in awe. Well, one, one of the things I'm struck by is, is just, um, in knowing all of your stories is that you knew how to ask the right questions or the whole question of where do I focus my attentions and what are the, the questions that are relevant. Like, like, like Brian, when you arrived in Lefkowitz's lab that you wanted to work on the adrenaline receptor, not, not on others. And Alexa, you talked about um, how being at Yale, uh, you learned to ask questions that um, you were interested in, and, and Lee, in, in, in your work um, in, in cardiology, just knowing what to focus on, and, and Jerry, all the time, uh, in thinking of the, the newest drug that might be helpful to people. I, I'm just curious, um, how did the Yale system teach you how to think in terms of asking questions and figuring out what is the most relevant thing to focus on? I'll give you a very quick answer. Uh, it taught me not to be afraid to fail. Because I failed quite a bit in medical school uh, in a variety of things. And I learned from those failures. And occasionally, I did succeed in something. Um, and I think for me, it was that I didn't <laughs> I think the challenges I had had in doing research prior to that, and again, you know, undergrad and early med school research are not that sophisticated research, but I found when I would talk to a principal investigator and they would say, I have a project for you, student, and I would start to work on that project, it was really hard to engage on that project because it wasn't my question. And so it was the permission to say, you can go further and engage on the questions that interest you, find the people who support you in that. So it inverted the process for me as opposed to just the goal of I get a project, I do these experiments, I answer this part of my PI's question. All of a sudden it was the freedom to explore what my own questions were and the support I needed for. For me, I think primarily it was just having not having a defined body of knowledge that I was responsible for. And, and then I just started becoming more interested in pursuing things that I didn't understand or things that I found particularly interesting. I also have to say that the, the fact that we took classes with graduate students and that many of my uh, classmates were MD, PhD students, uh, I really, you know, we, we had discussions where, you know, they were just expressing interest in some some very, very basic uh, concepts that would never probably be on the boards, for, at least for another decade. 
and mm -hmm. and they were just so they were just so excited about it, and uh, I, you know, I, I think that is part of it as well. I'll echo. Uh, clearly, there's a core of knowledge that we all need to get across a very broad spectrum, uh, but what the curriculum allowed, especially at the time with the year and a half uh, at the end, was the ability to focus a lot on things of particular interest. And I wouldn't say ignore, but certainly substantially de-emphasize those areas in which you had less interest. Um, and you know, seeing classmates who became plastic surgeons uh, had skills I didn't have, and it made no sense for me to try to replicate that and spend lots of time trying to get up to some level of mediocrity in things in which I just had no skill. Instead, I could focus on those areas of special interest where hopefully I had probably more skill. And that, that freedom, that elective time, if you will, mm -hmm. I think was really critical. And I'll go back to what I said before. Uh, there was a lot of literature at the time on how much medical students changed for the worse during their four years of medical school. That your, that your idealism, your liberalism, your whatever, just got beaten out of you. And uh, at Yale, that didn't happen. So someone said before that in some ways the curriculum was defined by the things that were absent. In many ways, same thing there. The thing that was absent was that that didn't get beat out of us. So it didn't get beat out of me. And, and that, was, that was precious because that was one of the things that was highly at risk in what was then the typical medical school curriculum elsewhere. I just had a question uh, further on the point of collaboration, and not so much from the student standpoint, but from the faculty standpoint. As you probably know, there's a movement with the pendulum swinging way over to left or right, depending on how you feel about it, uh, where uh, lectures will be no longer part of the curriculum. Uh, and those of us who have a healthy bank of PowerPoint presentations are a little worried about this. So I'm just <laughs> interested in um, how the faculty here would feel about a drift in that direction or at your medical schools? I'll just comment briefly. I can tell you that uh, at Columbia we still have some number of lectures. Uh, they're all videoed. Uh, some people come to see them live. Some people watch them. Some people may watch them at double speed or triple speed. Some people may watch the slides without the audio. Uh, some people may just read the book. I think we are in an era in which people learn different ways. Uh, we do expect students to come to the small groups. Um, I think they mostly do. Uh, but I, I think you're right that what we've discovered is that the way we historically were taught, and many of us then tried to teach, is not the way that many people learn. And so I, I think we are going to be in this era in which there are lots of different ways to get the the relevant information, and we're going to have to recognize that uh, many lectures will be poorly attended. On the other hand, back to my experience, I went to very, very few classes, but I went to every biochemistry class. Uh, Lubert Stryer, who became obviously very well known, was rehearsing his textbook in our class, and he was just terrific. And even though he passed out the notes, and you could have just read them, he was so engaging that the room was always full. So I think it's going to, you know, my uh, dream is it will raise the level uh, of teaching uh, because if your teaching is not good enough, uh, you'll be in front of an empty classroom. Yeah, and, and it, there's clearly a huge generational shift in this as well. So when you survey you know, practicing physicians, they still, you know, and their mean age is probably 51 to 52 at this point in the US, they still want the lecture. They want the in-person delivery of the information. So part of this is recognizing as the audience shifts and changes. And there's no replacement for the interaction. I think it's how do we recharacterize that interaction. And in most of our medical schools, frankly, the number of faculty we have to the number of students is so high that we can do a lot of customized individual small group activities. And so this concept, and I, I'm not an education expert, but the concept of the inverted classroom, right, where you're spending your evening not doing the project work but listening to the lecture, spending the time in person in a collaborative 
uh, engaged, interactive environment. Uh, you know, it's a very interesting concept that I think is clearly going to change how we teach. And that's in some ways what we have always done on the wards anyway, right? That is an experiential apprenticeship model um, that pe people clearly learn a lot from. Yeah, there are two points uh, that I'd like to make. Um, the most important thing is that you have access to the knowledge in a way in which you can understand and you, ha and you have the ability to talk to people who actually understand it so they can answer your questions and clarify misunderstandings or misperceptions, whatever. Um, I think, you know, I'll just, the last time I was in academics, I taught the GI pathophysiology course at UC Davis. And I got up and I said to, to the students, <laughs> it's a bigger, slightly bigger class, that uh, I'm going to make this, we're going to make this so understandable that I want everyone in the class to get an A. And which we did, by the way. And, we, and the, the exam was not easy, but everyone got an A. And uh, I was reported to the dean for subverting the curriculum. And I said, what did I do wrong? Uh, I, we taught it very well. The harder concepts we, we spent more time on, and we made ourselves available. I, pers you know, each of, I'm not going to be totally repetitious about all us learning d different ways, but it's, the point is, it's our obligation as educators, not that I'm one anymore, uh, to get people through a four-year experience where they actually have been exposed to medicine. They can ask the question, what's important to me, what I want to become, and uh, they can understand what doctors are talking about in this moment in time. And, and if you don't have an absolute commitment for learning for the rest of your life, then you shouldn't have become a doctor. You should be a, a toenail clipper or something. Propodness, <laughs> uh, I think that's what they call it. Uh, I, I think there will always be need for lectures. I think, you know, depending upon what it is you're trying to convey. I think it, at Stanford, what I've seen over the past, say, uh, 10 years or so are, are that, that the lectures are somewhat changing. Um, for me, what was most interesting at Yale was I was attending lectures that weren't necessarily um, you know, providing me with facts that I had to memorize, but uh, showing me how to uh, interpret data. And, and, and that's something that one person might be really good at, but the other 10 people who are doing small group sessions may not be. I think that's the challenge in the small group sessions that we have at least at Sanford is to get people to, do, to, to volunteer for them and to get them to train ahead of time so that they're all uniform. So um, I think it's the idea of the flipped classroom uh, may not work for everything. And, and particularly, it's, it's, it's very challenging to uh, recruit faculty who have clinical commitments, they have uh, research commitments, and it takes a lot more uh, faculty time. Just looking at the past and the future, at Stanford also you are, um, it's where massively open online courses or MOOCs uh, originated, uh, where lectures are broadcast not just to the audience, but whoever wants to see them in the world. And then um, in, in, ancient, in, in the beginnings of our medical profession, uh, with Asclepios, um, things were taught in small groups and with, with the patient there. What's interesting is that, you know, we, as you said, all of our lectures, basic science lectures, are, are, are um, available online in real time. Uh, but we always have it, roughly about a third of the class that comes. And they're very, at least this year's class, they're very engaged. And it's more, it's almost like a small group feel uh, than, say, what the, the lecture, the way lectures were many years ago. My name is Brendan Graber. I'm uh, actually a relatively recent graduate from uh, 2006. And I've heard all of you mention some things that have been pretty hot button topics here for the Yale system, specifically with respect to mandatory small groups, uh, qualifying exams, flipped classroom. And uh, those changes, to sort of borrow from the Winternet's quote we saw earlier, they have made some inroads into the Yale system. And so I'm really curious as to whether all of you can comment on 
to what degree you think the, the spirit and the substance of the Yale system survive in the time of those changes. That's a good final question, I'd say. Okay. <laughs> and, and also the, the previous. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in because I'm, I'm at the end of the alphabet. Um, I forgot about this, but they divided my class into groups of four. So William, Zelda, Siminski, and Ziff. And if you actually look at who those four people were, you had a guy who had been in Vietnam and had come back and went to medical school. He had been a Yale undergraduate. You had a woman who got a PhD and was in her mid-30s. You had a PhD from Stanford. He was at the Stanford Linear Accelerator or something, uh, who, a physicist who decided he'd go to medical school. He was 42. <laughs> and you had me, uh, this, this geek who was in an MD, PhD program. We examined each other. We were, in, I don't know how many things we went together. And uh, we learned a lot from each other. And we were very different. And then we went our separate ways. Um, I hope Yale still does that. <laughs> but uh, that, that was also an important part of the curriculum. And we, we went first year, we mentored right up to the time we went into the wards. And you know, I think just like everything else in life, there's uh, there are degrees across the spectrum, right? So, uh, if you can figure out how to build safety nets, there's obviously regulatory requirements that are you know need to be satisfied as well, but still allow 80% of the flexibility. Maybe that's the win. Um, it doesn't all have to be one or the other. Um, and so I think that's really the challenge, is how do you continue to modernize? How do you keep the spirit alive? I think clearly everyone here has felt like the flexibility and the philosophy gave us the freedom to explore in ways that were very successful for us. Um, that doesn't, we all still had to take a test as well uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, I think it's about what the balance of those are and how much flexibility and the and again, the permission to seek the flexibility, right? Not everybody needs it, but for people who really want it and know how to use it, you need to give them that opportunity to figure out how to manage whatever other requirements you may put in. Uh, there are parts of uh, the Yale system that I think are extremely important and should never be messed with. And there are other parts around the, the margins that uh, are periodically problematic. If nine people in my class, 17 people in your class failed the boards, then the school let some people down. Uh, could that all have been fixed by having more close monitoring? I probably would the first person they would have gone after. <laughs> uh, so I, I think those are, are some of the issues. I think we also have to be careful here. Uh, when I was talking about changing the Columbia curriculum, one of the most instructive pieces of feedback I got was from uh, one of our uh, educators who said, you know, what you did is not what most students want to do. Uh, you, know, you have to be careful here. Everybody's somewhat different. So I, I think that you know, if we say that a critical part of the Yale curriculum is to treat medical students more like graduate students, more like college students, to give them more of a degree of control over their education, to have them think broadly, to have them be able to focus on things they really care about and spend enough time to be conversant or OK in things that they're never going to really excel in, but not be forced to have to spend an ordinary amount of time in those areas. Those are all extremely important. I think when you get to issues of you know, should there be exams or shouldn't there be exams, I love the fact that there were no exams, but I can't say that that's you know, the most important thing about the Yale system. Um, I think the concept of having no grades in the uh, pre-clerkship portion of the curriculum is very important. I didn't use it for collegiality, but it certainly made the whole environment more collegial. So I think it depends on sort of what you're trying to, what part of it you're trying to get at. Um, but I think it's, if I look at the Yale system, I keep on coming back to what I'll call the philosophy of that system. 
and the individual pieces may have to change a little bit over time. But again, my enthusiasm for my experience is always tempered by the fact that nine of my classmates didn't pass the boards, and that made it tougher for them to get internships. And for their Yale experience, it wasn't what it could have been. And you know, that shouldn't have been the downside. So uh, as happy as I was, and as wonderful as I feel about the curriculum, in my experience, that's, that's a, it's a sobering you know, other side of this. And I think we have to keep that in mind and recognize that some of the individual pieces may not be sacrosanct. What's sacrosanct is the, I say, is the philosophy, the theory of a medical school being part of a great university and being, uh, having its curriculum taught and its students treated like <coughs> university students as opposed to very narrowly preparing people for a trade. Um, what I'm about to say may not be that popular. <laughs> I think, so I don't really know exactly what the curriculum is. I, I've, I've read uh, an, the article in the Yale Medicine News last fall. Um, my feeling is that a lot of medical schools, including Stanford, uh, a number of years ago, uh, started to try to introduce clinical uh, skills very early on. Um, they did it at the expense of time for basic, uh, uh, basic science. And at a time when there was more to know. Um, and and I, I think that wasn't necessarily a good idea. I, I you know, we, we had some, maybe I think every week we had maybe a, a, a session with our other, our, our small group uh, where we learned to do physical exams and so forth. But really our first two years were really to really uh, get a good foundation in, in the basic sciences. And I think we were really good clinicians when we came out at the end of it. At least my, I know my, my colleagues were. So I, I'm, I also think that the introduction early on in, in an effort to sort of integrate clinical and basic science means that the faculty are digesting a lot of the information and feeding it to students as opposed to students really getting the, the fundamentals. So I'm, you know, to the extent that's hap happening, I would say I think it's not a good thing at least not for the few places like Yale, like Stanford, like Harvard, where there's a really strong basic research uh, presence here. And you know, we, should be treat, we, we should be focusing on uh, teaching clinician scientists to, to, um, because it's a, it's a dying breed. OK, so, so um, I think um, may, maybe just in, in conclusion, I can ask everybody to just say a couple lines of to you, what is the Yale system? And then we'll conclude. And in the afternoon, um, there is the program from 2.15 to 4.15. And Richard, where, where do people sign up for that? Do you, do you know? Oh, OK. Anyway, so, so what is the Yale system? And just a couple of lines from everybody. To, to me, it's, it's a, a graduate school of, of medicine. A graduate school of medicine. And you said something similarly. Yeah, I, I, I would echo that. That's, that's the overarching philosophy, yes. Uh -huh. okay. um, the Yale system as conceived, uh, at least by Wintonitz, is to be exposed to, to learn enough so you can interact with physicians, to apprentice basically through your clerkships, and then to have the next year and a half to reflect on what you just learned so you can get a trajectory for the rest of your life. Uh, and I think um, I, that's why I love the idea that we're training scholars in medicine and it is a graduate school. I think the, the underpinning is the permission, uh, more than the permission, the encouragement to explore the areas where you can become great uh, and the commitment to lifelong both learning and improvement. Um. Well, thank you.